Hi everyone, welcome to today's AFP panel. Um, over the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to be giving you an overview of what is an AFP, a bit about the application process, and we'll be taking any questions you've got. Um, we've got a mixture of current AFP doctors today and a few of us have done our AFP already. Um, I'll start off just by introducing myself. Um, I'm Daniel. I just recently graduated from Imperial College and I'm about to start my AFP um, in London on Monday. Um, I'm one of the co-leads on Becoming a Doctor's upcoming AFP course. We'll tell you more about that at the end of today's panel. Um, so only about this time last year, I was starting kind of my application to the AFP, applied obviously to London, but also to the Northern AFP Foundation School as well, Newcastle. Um, and I'll be chatting to you a bit shortly about how the application process works. Tanya? Hi. Hi, everyone. My name is Tanya Tarr. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Um, so I'm currently um, waiting to start my academic foundation program in the Norfolk and Norwich University Hospital. I recently graduated from Norwich Medical School. And um, so last, around this time last year as well, I started applying. And the two deaneries that I apply and got offer from is Oxford and Norwich. And um, we're hoping that today we'll be able to answer some of your questions and perhaps uh, provide an, a brief introduction to the AFP. So shall I hand over to Angelica? Hi, I'm Angelica. I'm about to start my AFP in London. I'm a Cardiff Uni graduate and I also applied to Norwich and London and was successful in both. Um, as part of becoming a doctor, I'm preparing some resources for you on the white space questions and I'll be talking about that a bit later. It's right. I think uh, the video is froze. <laughs> James, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So my name is James. I'm a current academic clinical fellow in general surgery at the University of Cambridge. I undertook my academic foundation program in surgery at Imperial College London. I applied to both London and Manchester. And so only actually went to one interview, which was London. But I've helped quite a few uh, prospective and successful candidates take the AFP previously as well. All right. Thank you, James. Um, I think um, Isra just, internet just dropped, I think. Anyway, shall we um, start regardless and then we'll introduce Isra? Yeah. Um, so I think yeah. your are yeah, I'll just bring up your slides for you as you're trying to. Let me know if you need me to move you on to the next slide. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Can you see this now on the screen? Yeah, I just need to double click. <laughs> All right. So the first bit that we wanted to talk you through, um, it will just probably less than five minutes, really. So nothing in detail. So uh, my part is to cover what is actually an AFP and then touch on a very um, brief um, description of what, what the possible structure could be around the UK. So um, the next slide, please, um, James. Um, done. So um, an AFP is an ACMIC Foundation program. So it's a variation of the UK FPO um training program for newly graduated doctors. So it has been designed um, to aim to provide um, a taster to academic medicine for newly graduated doctor and um, doctors who are successful in gaining um, an opportunity to do an AFP program will do an AFP with um, the requirements to also fulfill the, the standard uh, foundation program requirements so over two years. So next slide, please. So um, there are three main themes of AFP at the moment. There's a new theme coming up. I'm not sure whether you guys are aware. It's called digital health. Um, and this will be um, in 2019, 2020. But the ma main three themes are research, medical education, and leadership and management. And within these themes, you can also do projects based on your own interests and career aspirations. For example, you can cater towards cardiology, surgery, GP, wh whatever you'd like to do. And, um, just a note to, that these AFP projects that you have to, de, uh, to, to do or design um, can be clinical based. It could also be uh, lab based. It can be paper based, which means that some people do a systematic review in their academic foundation program. 
and um, just a note that um, all these programs have um, have uh, associations with a university or a medical school, which mean that you will have opportunities to get involved with teaching throughout. And also because of the fact that the association of university, you can get access to facilities for research, library and support. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to take you guys through the most common structures of, uh, of AFP, but just to introduce um, the UK Foundation Programme structure for us. So um, normally you will have six different rotations and each rotation will last four months throughout the last uh, throughout the two years of your foundation training programme. And the first option um, that is most commonly available in the UK is um, uh, when you have one block which means four months dedicated towards academic foundation program research, whatever you want to do. Um, another um, option is that uh, some deaneries can give you um, a day academic release, which means that you might have one day weekly or depends on what arrangement they might have. It might be two to um, and uh, that will be across two years of your training in the AFP program. And there are some deaneries that are happy with um, mixing both so a shorter block off but also a day academic release throughout one thing to bear in mind that there's newcastle i believe uh, they have two block of academic, academic for, um, foundation programs so it means that you have a different a month um off for doing um afp but you still do on call so that's one of uh, the exception there so yeah next slide please So just to touch on a bit of statistics, um, at the moment we have about 5% of um, the general, um, you know, out of the, the overall um, foundation program posts in the UK that are AFP. But the recent um, statistic has shown that um, it has, uh, the AFP has increasingly become very popular. And um, the last year there's 20% of AFP um, of, of applicants to the UK FBO programs actually applied uh, for an AFP program. Uh, um uh you know job so yeah so uh, just to summarize what i've spoken about so key point afp is a taster of academic medicine and teaching opportunities often run alongside your projects and it's very important to to, to, to bear in mind that um, you do not have to do an afp to, in order to follow your academic career uh, in the future because some you know you might not be able to make a decision now you know for the next five years and actually some of my uh, friends who are acf at the moment are very successful who did not do an afp and there's a difference between applying for an AFP and actually doing an AFP, even though you're not sure whether you want to do, you know, research in your foundation year, that's fine. But just to bear in mind that um, applying to an AFP might give you a lot of benefits because James and other people who are further in their career probably will be able to tell you that a lot of postgraduate um, career, you know, select, um, uh, selection and recruitment have very similar structure in terms of interviews and preparation so therefore if you have more um you know um experience in afp interview then the more likely you get the the job you want in the future when the times come so that's my part so shall i hand over to the process of um applying for an afp sure great thanks for that tanya okay. um so as tanya just uh, alluded to um the afp application process whether you end up securing an AFP post or not is actually quite useful to your future career. Most of you today, probably the last interview you ever had was for medical school. For the last three, four years, maybe the only other interview you've had is perhaps a job interview. All AFP posts interview their candidates. And when you go on later to specialize, to choose a particular specialty, you will get interviewed as well. So actually applying to the AFP does set you up quite well for some of those stages in your future career anyway. It gives you a good bit of practice early on. Um, so for the next 10 minutes or so, I'm gonna chat through how does the application process work? And I'll hand over to Angelica and Isra at a few points where they can tell you a few more details. Um, now, Tanya's just spoken there about kind of what actually is an AFP um, and kind of just to put that in one sentence, it's a normal junior doctor job where you have some dedicated time to do some research. So if you're interested in research, you're interested in education or leadership and management, certainly a good thing to think about. Yes, it has become more competitive over the last few years. You might have heard of students in the years above you who've been through the process before. So I'll take you through kind of the key stages now. 
on the screen here, hopefully you can now see this, this schematic of the different parts of the application process. So I'll talk you through them one by one. So we'll start with the first step, the Oriel application. Oriel is just the online system that you apply for your junior doctor jobs through. So everyone goes through this online system. It, it's like the foundation equivalent of UCAS. That's how you might want to look at it. So how the Oriel application normally works, most people use it to apply for a foundation program, their FY1 and FY2 post. And about 90% of the jobs out there are this type. Tanya mentioned it earlier. Typically, it's two years long. And it's made up of six rotations each around four months. But yeah, for the last 10 years or so, there's also now been academic foundation jobs that are created quite similarly. You're still going to do six rotations most of the time. But probably one of those is going to be dedicated to doing a bit of research or the research might be mixed in throughout those two years. Last couple of years, they've also introduced two other jobs, two other types of job that we'll talk about now. Foundation priority programs. These are very similar to normal junior doctor posts, just they're often in areas of the country that might struggle normally to recruit doctors or in certain specialties. And often you get added benefits, you might get extra training, you might even get a financial bonus to applying to these. And finally, specific jobs where there is a focus on psychiatry for applicants interested in that specialty. I'm not going to talk too much about options three and four because obviously you're all here today to learn about the AFP. Some key things to be in, keep in mind though, you must apply for your foundation program first. So normally this is around September, October time. Um, in your final year of medical school. You'll go onto the Oriel website and you'll have to apply to your junior doctor jobs first. Once you've done that, apply for your AFP. Um, with junior doctor jobs, you actually have to rank every area of the UK. The AFP is a bit different. So instead with the AFP, they don't have deaneries, they have what are called academic units of application. So there are, I believe, in total about 16 different areas of the UK you can apply to. As they are quite competitive, there are only a maximum of two applications you can make. So for myself, like I said, I picked London in the southeast and I picked northern. So those are my two. You don't have to apply to two. Some people only apply to one. And again, this is completely optional. But that's one, obviously, first decision you would need to make. Where are you going to apply? Maybe we can chat about that a little bit later in the Q&A. So you might wonder, if I apply to the AFP, will it affect any of my other applications? No. Your other applications will go ahead as normal. The only point at which there might be an impact is if you get offered an AFP job and you accept it, then that will be the end of your application. You often find out the results of your AFP application before everything else. If you reject it, you'll just go on to the other applications. If you accept an offer, then you've got your job and the application process stops there. But just deciding to apply makes no difference to your other applications. So that's just the application itself, just filling in the form. Once that goes off, it's then up to those units that we just talked about. It's up to them to decide who's going to make it to the interview. And some of them will go through a process called long listing. So you've probably heard of shortlisting before. Shortlisting is where, okay, they look at your application and decide who to interview. So what is long listing? Long listing is only used by a small handful of these units. Most don't actually do this. Long listing is where they have a very long list of applicants and it would be way too time consuming to go through and score each of them formally. So to make their job slightly easier, perhaps it's a bit mean for you, um, but it makes their life a bit easier. Normally what they'll do is they'll look at everyone's decile. So they'll look at where did you come in your year at medical school? Top 10%, top 20, top 30. And they'll often set a cutoff score. If you're above the cutoff score, you make it to the next stage. If you're below the cutoff score, unfortunately, you don't. As I said, most places don't do this. Last year, the only areas to do so were London, Yorkshire and Humber, and Wales. 
Um, again, we'll be releasing some info over the coming months with what those cutoff scores were. To take London, for example, in order to move to the next stage with London, you have to be in the top 30% of your year at medical school. How will you know what where you are? Your medical school will tell you because when you apply for normal foundation jobs, your normal junior doctor jobs, this forms part of the application process anyway. So do you need a high decile to get an AFP post? Generally speaking, no. However, if you are going for those places that use long listing, this is definitely something to keep in mind. But whether long listing is what happens or not, if you progress through that stage, you then go on to short listing, which is something you've probably heard of before. This is where they will formally go through the application you've sent them and they'll decide based off this who to interview and who not to interview. So what actually goes on the application? There are two key things they're going to look at. One thing that they call education achievements. So these are things like any awards, prizes, or any research that you've done in the past, and white space questions. Angelica will speak about those in a second. Just to tell you more about those education achievements then. So when you send off your application, in the form for the AFP application, you can include the following. You can mention up to two additional degrees you've done. Most people obviously will not. You might have intercalated, you might have done a bachelor's or a master's, you could put that down. Or if you're a graduate student, you might have done a degree before applying, so you might be able to put that down as well. Or yes, maybe you're really into research, you've done a PhD, you could include that also. You can then submit up to 10 publications you've got in the past, 10 presentations at conferences or meetings, and 10 prizes or awards. These might be things that you've been awarded for doing well in your exams at medical school, or maybe it was an essay competition that you entered somewhere else. Now, I know that's quite daunting. What I really stress here, most 90% plus applicants do not have all of these things. Um, so for myself, I had one publication. Um, I obviously had one degree. I had a few presentations, maybe about four, I'd say, in total. Obviously, everyone has their strengths and weaknesses. So don't think you need 10 publications or you need 10 prizes. The more of these you have, the better. So if you're a few years away from applying, this does show you the kind of things that you want to go out and work on. Um, but generally speaking, these are the main things they're going to use to decide who progresses to the interview stage. But the only other thing on top of this are those white space questions. So I'll hand over to you now, Angelica. Do you want to tell us a bit more about these? Sure. So as I said, I applied to Norwich and that's where I had to do some white space questions. So next slide will tell us a bit more. Um, so white space questions are essentially like a mini personal statement except they you are given the focus questions to answer. They're a really good opportunity to describe your own unique experiences and actually put in content that may not be available anywhere else in your application. You can really convince your academic unit of application that you are the best candidate possible for the job. So as I mentioned, the questions are usually targeted to a few different domains. This may be things like research, teaching, leadership or teamwork, and it's your job to implement your experiences in those different domains into your answers. Now, as a personal statement is free prose, in these sort of, sort of white space questions, it's really important that you target your answers. And actually, as Dan's mentioned, you may not have 10 publications and you may be quite close to applying. You may not have any control left over your rank and your EPM. So these white space questions are something that you have power over in the present. So I would suggest that you make most of them. Next slide. Okay. So I just thought I'd go through a bit of the format of the white space questions. So essentially they are set by each of the academic unit of application every year. The number of questions and the content may vary year on year between all the different academic units of application, but also within the same academic unit of application. Typically there tend to be from up to one white space question up to six 
that you have to answer for each of the academic unit of application. And some of them don't have white space questions at all. So these will not form part of their application process. So for example, they don't require candidate. For example, London, they don't require candidates to answer any of these white space questions. So you'll be off the hook if you apply there. Um, but actually, that you don't have to worry about the white space questions because you are given time to think about them and answer them. So the best place to go and get this information is the UK FPO website. And they release these questions in a document uh, just before the oral applications open. So you get an opportunity to look at which academic unit of application you're interested in applying to and see what their white space questions are and which domains they would like you to focus on. Um, the other main thing to mention is the word count. So these questions do come with a word count and normally it's around 225 words. But again, check that document just to see the specific word count of your academic unit of application. It's really important that you are aware of this beforehand because the last thing you want is to write a brilliant answer and then to realise that you won't be able to submit half of it. Um, and also the word, word count is helpful. So as we keep saying, you don't need lists and lists of different achievements. It's typically in 225 words, you'll only be able to highlight two or three experiences properly. So if that's all you have and you're worried about it, then actually that is the amount that you'll be able to put in anyway, compared to other candidates. So next up, I thought we'd have a look at one of the white space questions just to orientate you to what it's like. So I've chosen this one, which is please describe your research and teaching experience. And I'm just going to break this question down a little bit for you, just so you can start to appreciate what to look at when you are reading through these questions. So the first thing to notice in this question is that it has two elements. So the first part is research and the word and there and teaching. So for the best marks for your white space question answer, you have to address both of these domains. So in an answer, just focusing on research and not focusing on any teaching, you're probably not likely to get the best marks. So have a look at these connecting words, because in a similar question, it may say, please describe your research or your teaching experience. And in that case, it would be absolutely fine to just focus on one of those domains. The next thing to note with these questions are quite generic. The question itself, it doesn't the number of experiences that you should mention for each the depth of your content for each of the domains, it's kind of up to you to decide what you do put in. Now, personally, in terms of these experiences, I put in the ones where, which most inspired me to apply for an academic foundation program or most made me appreciate the skills that I might need in an academic foundation program. Other questions may focus on your motivations for applying to the AFP. Um, and then in that case, it's really important that you have a look at the program that you're applying to specifically. And also they may ask why you want that specific deanery. Um, so it, some of these questions do require a little bit of background research just to make sure that you are answering them correctly. Um, and the last thing I wanted to mention is the word describe. So this suggests that each of your experiences, they do want you to go into some depth about um, what you what your experiences are and what you've gained from them. In another question, it may just say list, which more suggests that they want, as it says, a list, but maybe more of a brief um, explanation. So again, picking out these different parts of the question is really important when you're thinking about formatting it. Um, and just be able to reflect would be my main advice when you are giving um, answers on experience. But we have prepared some resources as part of becoming a doctor where there are set structures that you can use because it can be really da daunting having a blank space in front of you. And I just thought I'd end with some top tips. And these are kind of in a format of a timeline. So if you are really far away from applying for the AFP, perhaps you're in the younger years of medical school, I would say start making a list of your achievements. As you go through medical school, you'll be part of lots of activities. And if you don't make a note, you'll often forget. And it's those small activities that sometimes can 
yield really good skills. So small volunteering activities you've been part of, or maybe in lockdown you've taught a group of medical students, that could be really useful for a question asking about teaching. And think about non-academic things as well, because some questions, they want you to focus on just your non-academic achievements. So have a think about what hobbies and things you've done during medical school. The next thing is, and I've gone on about this, but please read the question carefully, look at the different parts of it and what it really wants from you and address it. So make sure you're answering the question. Uh, the next thing is drafting your answers early. So I know that I, it's gonna be different for you next year than it was for us. And there'll be a lot of deadlines and things, perhaps at the same time of, at, of these applications. But if you start thinking about these questions early, begin writing your answers, it's likely you'll have more time to edit them, add things, remove things and send them to people. So make sure you start get a move on as soon as you get them really. Um, the next thing is to reflect, and it's definitely quality over quantity in these white space questions. Someone could have done a very small research project, which never got published, but actually have learned so much from it and be able to reflect that in their answers. So please don't worry if you don't have pages and pages in your portfolio. It's the small things that really do count in white space questions. And my last point is going to be reviewing. Um, and it's easy to write a question and then sort of want to submit it and not think about it, but please send it to your peers, doctors, academics, just to have a read through, firstly for grammar, and secondly, they may give you some advice. Um, and the last thing is, send it one at a time to people, but otherwise you'll be bombarded with feedback and um, it's just easier to edit things. And you don't have to take all the advice, so these are unique to you and make sure that they are a reflection of yourself rather than someone else. And that's it, that's white space questions. Great, thanks Angelica. Um, I'm just gonna briefly <laughs> talk about the rest of the process now, um, and then I'll hand over to the rest it's of the right, team you, to chat about a few of the things. Can you hear me? We can't hear you. Can hear you. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, so, so we, we're, we'll move on to this in a second, don't okay. so, as I was saying there, that in terms of the application process, we've chatted about you apply through Oriel. Some places may long list you using your EPM, your, your kind of decile at medical school. After that, all of these different units will shortlist you using a mixture of those education achievements and the white space questions that Angelica just spoke about now. Keep in mind, every unit uses these things differently. Like Angelica said, some have white, white space questions, some like London or Yorkshire don't. Um, and how they score different awards, how they score um, publications and presentations are all quite different. Some might accept a presentation at a student run conference, some might not. Some might accept a publication without a PubMed ID, but some might. So you might also want to have a look at the areas you're interested in, how will they themselves look specifically at your application? And if all of that goes well, like we said, that leads you to the interview stage. So in a second, I'll hand over to Isra who can speak a bit more about that. But after the interview, the final part of the application is obviously, do you get an offer or not? So how this works, it's a little bit complicated. Around January time, you will get an offer um, for an AFP job if you were successful. If you do not receive an offer, then you will just automatically progress to the rest of the jobs that you apply for through the normal foundation program. But if you get a job offer, first key thing is you have 48 hours to accept it. Not a lot of time. If you don't accept it in 48 hours, they assume that you have rejected the offer. And like earlier, you'll move on to your foundation program offers instead, which happens around March or April. But they also use a cascade system. What does this mean? So some people might be offered a job but it might not be their first choice job. There will be quite a few in each area that you're allowed to rank. And depending on how you did the interview, how you did on the shortlisting, you might get your first choice, second, third, and so on. So either you get a job that you like, you accept it, fantastic, that's the job you're going to have for the next two years. Alternatively, you are told that you didn't get any offers at all, okay, you just move on to foundation program. 
some people will look at the job offered and think, actually, you know what, I'm not sure I want to do this. I'm going to reject this and I'm going to go for foundation program instead. I'll, I'll see how things go with that. So that means every year there'll be a certain number of jobs that get rejected. So what they do is it's a bit like a waiting list. Some people who narrowly missed out on jobs. So what happens is the week after all the offers are sent out, um, the week after this, they'll then send all of the rejected offers out to the people on the waiting list and say, okay, you missed out on the first round, but these are some jobs that are now available second time round. Would you like to accept this? And again, they can choose to accept or reject. And this happens for a few weeks as they work their way through the waiting list. So that's kind of how to think about it. So some key tips on the application process. We said you can apply to two areas up to two, you can apply to only one if you want. And the things they're gonna look at are additional degrees, and for most that would be an intercalated degree if you've done one, 10 publications, 10 presentations, and 10 prizes. Emphasizing there the word up to, most people do not have all of those. Keep in mind though that no two applicants are the same. We said every area looks at you differently. So there might be a particular area that really likes publications there might be an area that really likes academic prizes. So depending on yourself and your profile, you might suit one area better than another, you might have better chances. Like we said, you do not need to be in the top decile. Many people will go on to get these posts without any publications, without any prizes. They're certainly helpful, and if you've got a few years ahead of you, I would suggest that you work on these, but it is not the be all and end all. Just getting lots of publications does not equal an AFP post. So I'm just gonna rewind slightly back to the interview stage and I'll hand over to Isra now, who's gonna tell us more about how the interviews work. Thanks, Dan. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so that, hi everyone, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I am just gonna pick up from where the others left off and talk about the AFP interview. Um, so let's fast forward and imagine that you're at the stage where you've submitted your application and you find out you've got an interview. So firstly, when might this be? I am aware that the timelines have shifted because of COVID um, for, for all of you and that your application deadline is actually later than ours was. Um, so it might be, the, Till, it might be around November, maybe beginning of December time that you're actually finding out about your interviews. And this will be made clear on the um, Academic Unit of Application website, so I wouldn't worry too much right now. Um, so you find out you've got an interview and now you think, oh gosh, I have to prepare for them. And it's quite overwhelming at first. I remember when I first got my interview off and I thought, where, where do I start? Um, and because obviously it's something that you care about quite a lot and you want to do your best. So I'm going to talk through the kind of base, the different parts of the interview. And obviously, if you have any questions, please do put them in below. So the structure of each interview will depend on the unit of application. Um, not all units of application are very clear about their interview structure. Um, so, for example, London and the South East are very transparent um, in their prospectus, in the academic training prospectus. They will mention that they have an academic interview and a clinical interview, um, which are 20 minutes each. And they'll tell you kind of what the task will be. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. However, um, I had friends that were applying to, for example, Scotland, and they didn't know what they would get until they got there on the day of the interview. Um, so it really will depend. My advice here would be to look at the website for the unit of application, see if there's an academic prospectus. And obviously, once um, you get an interview offer, you'll find out you'll find out more information, as much information. But yeah, use use other applicants. I would say um, use previous applicants as they will be a really useful tool. Um, they'll be able to tell you what they had in their year. Um, in some locations, this can also depend on the type of AFP you applied for. I'm aware that Tanya and Dan touched on this earlier, but so you're aware that you can apply for research AFPs or medical education AFPs or leadership AFPs. So in some locations, for example, the Southwest, which was the other units of application I applied for, um, they would interview their medical education candidates separately and also in a separate location and separate dates to their research candidates. And 
the questions asked would differ depending on the program applied for. However, another example in London, the Southeast, they didn't do this. They didn't discriminate between what you'd applied for. They didn't know what you'd ranked. So, um, so as in Dan and I um, had ranked different programs that we would have had the exact kind of the, the similar, the same format for interview, obviously very similar questions. So it's hard to know, and this, this can make it quite confusing. However, if you prepare for each part of the interview, there's no reason why you should be at a disadvantage, whether you know or you don't know. And I'm gonna try and help you with the next few slides and explain how you can do this. Okay, next slide, please, Dan. So academic, um, this is the one that kind of scares people a lot. Um, so with this, this will differ, again, between the academic units of application. You'll either get an abstract or a paper to critically appraise and a lot of deaneries will give you preparation time before and um, they'll give you perhaps half an hour total to prepare both this and your clinical section and um, which I'll talk about in a minute but some will not give you preparation time and will let you go in through the important thing to remember is that with you will be on an equal footing with the other candidates that you will do your interview alongside so for that deanery if you haven't had the prep time neither have they so try not to stress about this too much um, it will normally be an abstract or a paper from peer reviewed journal, um, so it won't be something completely rogue, don't worry. And the structure of the actual academic interview can vary. So I know within even within one deanery, I know some people ask just to present their critical appraisal of the abstract and talk through it um, without being asked anything. Whereas, for example, I was and I know a few others were asked um, continuous questions throughout um, on the abstract. So you kind of had to follow the interviewer's agenda rather than your own. My advice for preparing for the academic um, interview would be just to have when you get close to the interviews, not now, but um, look on, for example, the New England Journal of Medicine, The Lancet and um, look at some abstracts on there um, and see just start, see how quickly you can read them see just make bullet points of the key points that you're noting split it up into your kind of introduction your methods your results and your discussion and then the closer it gets um you can find structures on how to appropriately critically appraise and in our course we will also have a whole module on how to critically appraise so i won't talk much more about that for now okay moving on please dan thanks Okay, um, so I did briefly mention earlier the clinical side. So most units of application will also involve a clinical station or a clinical portion to the interview. This is important because obviously, while we are applying to the AFB, we're still doctors and we do actually need to achieve our clinical competencies in a shorter time than via the normal academic foundation programme. So as much as they can in an interview setting, they want to see that you are clinically competent. So. So the way some units of application will do it, um, they will give you a scenario again in that 30 minute preparation time, you'll have this clinical scenario and the abstract, and you have a read over and start to think about how you might approach it. So if I, I don't want to read from the screen, but if you just have a look at the slide um, below, so just my, the main way I would approach this is to kind of underline the key points. So who are you? You're the F1. What are you doing? You're on the medical on call and you're clerking patient nanny but what's happening someone's bleeped you asking to see someone and you've got very limited information on that so you think about how you'd manage it and what they're looking for is they're looking to see that you're safe first and foremost are you a safe doctor are you able to escalate um are you able to assess a deteriorating patient they're not expecting you to say to you know work wonders and put in chest strain and work beyond your competency they are just expecting you to keep a patient safe and um, if you, there are certain performers and um, certain structures that you can use to help you get through these stations so the way um, I would kind of approach a scenario like this and I know my colleagues um, Ta Tanya Dan and Angelica would probably differ in the way they would answer it potentially slightly um, would be that I'd want to find out more information so I know I've got a 66 year old with worsening breathlessness but what are her obs and um, what are the trend of these obs um, is, is the nurse concerned it's really hard to kind of think think pretend that you're on a ward when you're not um but the more you get into it the more you'll be able the more you'll do well in the station so really to think if you were in the situation what would you want to know and then it's essentially a prioritization scenario so are you going to prioritize this patient above this patient that you're clocking in a &E? because of the nature of the interview the chances are probably yes um, and then 
what they will want you to do is talk them through an A to E assessment most of the time. However, obviously this will differ and we will be providing a module on this interview section within our AFP course. Okay, next slide please, Dan. So personal questions. Um, this is also something that worries someone, uh, worries um, people applying for the AFP. Um, some academic units of application will have a separate personal question section. So um, a friend that applied to, I think it was Scotland, had a whole, had 10 minutes of personal questions, whereas um, for other deaneries, they will just slot them into academic and clinical scenarios. So just because your um, prospectus or your email says you have an academic and a clinical interview, it does not mean that you won't be asked personal questions. I would always, always prepare personal questions and I cannot emphasize this enough. This will, this might be your first impression that you give to them and you want to come across as being quite slick. They're also, obviously you don't want to come across as robotic or regurgitated, but they are also quite easy to kind of prepare for and make sure you have something sensible to say. So I've given some examples there. Um, your standard ones are, why do you want to pursue an AFP? Why do you want to be in this unit of application particularly? What, what are your plans um, for your AFP? What research are you interested in? Um, and there are structures that you can use to answer these questions. Um, so I don't know if anyone's heard of the STAR approach. Um, most people might have done. Um, it's used to um, answer kind of situational questions. So if they said, tell me about a time when you worked in a team and STAR would basically give you situation, task, your action and reflection. So you talk about what the situation was, um, what, was what needed you to work in a team, um, your task, what did you have to do? your action, what did you do and how did it go and reflect? What have you learned from it, which is the most important thing? And they want to see that you're very insightful. Um, another benefit to practicing these is to ensure you don't waffle, which is really, really important. So practicing these with other people, making sure that you're not just waffling on and on and on um, and not really adding any new information is really important. And again, we have a module on this um, as well as general interview technique um, in our course. So you should find that quite helpful. Okay, next slide. And the final kind of component of the interview process I'm going to talk about is ethics and professionalism. So this has this is becoming increasingly used in the AFP interviews. It wasn't a kind of standalone interview category in its own right. However, as with the personal questions, it can easily be slipped in to the academic and clinical interviews by asking about the ethical ethical nature of the abstract or what talking about the research ethics or the clinical ethics of a scenario. Um, so again, just because it says academic and clinical, don't become completely blindsided and make sure you, again, prepare for this part of the interview as well. Um, I have provided an example here. Um, so say you've got a clinical scenario and you're dealing with a patient and then at the end or halfway through the interview, um, one of the interviewers might ask you, oh, so by the way, um, you know, you've dealt with this patient's breathlessness, well done, you saved them. Um, however, we're not going to let you off that easily. This patient's daughter's been reading the notes, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> You're like, uh, because you thought you were, you thought you were free. Um, and Again, there are structures to approach this. Obviously, thinking through, like looking at this, you're like, oh God, what am I going to do? But if you follow, think clearly, give yourself a few seconds, think about the structures, think about your knowledge from placements. You've been in hospitals, you know what you're doing. Um, you know about reporting systems, you know who you can talk to, who are seniors, you know about confidentiality. You Drawing on all of that knowledge and as well as the structures, you will be absolutely fine and equipped to answer this. Um, again, we have, guess what, another module in our free AFP course. Um, we're, we're spoiling you guys. Um, and let me, um, just to answer, um, it, it will be a free open access course and just answer one of the questions. So don't worry, it's, it, it wouldn't be something you'd have to pay for. And when, it, when the modules become available, we will definitely be posting about it. So very excited for that. And um, so I'm just going to finish with my top tips for interview preparation. I'm aware I've given you a lot of information. Um, my top tips would be, Honestly, don't panic. I know people think that other people are more slick, more um, more kind of refined. People think other people are going to talk about their 10 research projects that all got published, which is a myth, by the way. Um, 
it's not the case they want to see I had a mock interview and the most useful thing I took away from that was they want to see passion they want to see that you care about what you want to study they don't want to see that you're a robot who's done the same things that everyone else has done and they want to see like kind of individuality they want to be able to stand you out from the crowd which is hard because okay they're seeing so many people and again you're not going to be able to stand out massively but even with those little anecdotes so a team might think you could mention something outside of medicine or you know drawn an experience that other people might not have had so you know give it some passion give it individuality and prepare with others support each other um i know medical school can become a bit of a vicious atmosphere sometimes i would hope that we would all try and support each other but i think now even more so use each other to give each other honest feedback practice with each other um give each like do you even run mock interviews with each other me and my friends did we would time each other we'd prep the scenarios and time each other and then um give each other really really honest feedback so support each other um and again we will be in touch when we have the resources out thank you Isra. anyway thank you very much great thanks for that Isra. so the four of us now obviously have talked through with you what is an afp and if you're interested in applying how do you get to that offer um now the main limitation for all of us is we're yet to actually do our AFP project. Although the application is quite fresh in our minds, um, we're still a year or two away from actually sitting down to do our research block. So we're going to hand over now to James, who incidentally has done his AFP yeah. post already, so he can share with you a few insights from that. Thanks, James. Thanks, James. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I'll try and keep this a bit brief so we can get to all those good questions. But I um, I finished my AFP from Imperial College London in 2019, just gone. And my setup was a four month block in the first rotation of FY2, um, which still had its on-call duties uh, every two weeks or so, but otherwise was completely and I spent that research time trialing a new way of teaching medical students surgical skills. Um, and this was set up in a randomized controlled trial. Um, the AFP time for me began immediately from the FY1 year, which had no academic time, but I was still trying to join weekly academic meetings. I was creating a protocol and reviewing all the literature base and gaining ethical approval for this study. And then I was drafting proposals to gain some funding and trialing some new equipment with manufacturers. There are different ways to do the academic block and some people may contribute to ongoing projects, but my project was a very fresh new project. And then during the four months of academic time, my main role was to recruit participants, which were usually senior medical students, and I was running a trial with them almost every day, uh, teaching them this novel way to learn skills. And then after that rotation finished, we still hadn't quite reached the power for the study. So I continued to recruit and trial participants when I rotated onto a busy A&E rotation. Uh, and during this time and the remainder of the AFP, I was analyzing results, drafting a manuscript and presenting this work across the UK and internationally as well. So I think I'm here really to give some insights into some of the benefits and some of the uh, downsides to the AFP. Uh, the biggest benefit is the chance to explore things outside of the day-to-day -day role as a clinical doctor. And this is often quite intellectually engaging. Some of you may have found is when you're medical students or when you're junior doctors, often you are receptive to teaching and you will be taught by seniors but when you're an academic doctor you have the ability to engage with people as equals almost research discuss academia discuss what you've read in your week and contribute to an ongoing discussion and you're unlikely to really get that as an fy1 doctor not really discussing any of your experiences you're just being taught by clinicians so it's very intellectually engaging having that academic time. And you also, it also means that you build skills which you can't build in the clinical world, such as working with 
business or working with scientists or bucking things, discussing things, all these communication skills and all these technical lab based skills, you just can't develop as a clinician. So having that side is a fantastic pro to the academic foundation program. I think one of the biggest benefits to it seriously is that you actually gain insights into being an academic, even if you don't publish or present anything during your AFP, you'll still be part of a lab and a named member of that lab where you gain insight into how research works, how funding works, the difficulties of it, the failures of it. And there's much more to research and teaching and management than just publishing papers and doing research. There's a lot of politics and a lot of difficulties and struggles behind it. And you only really gain that insight if you are part of a team and part of a lab, which the AFP gives you. And then beyond your project, you get to spend a lot of your time as you wish. It's very unstructured. So you can do a lot of teaching if that's what you like to do on the side. You can even build projects or businesses. You can spend your time going to conferences or working or talking with people that you may not meet otherwise. So you can get to do a lot of different experiences. And I was able to do quite a lot of teaching, quite a lot of side projects, work with some charities other things that I would never have had the opportunity or time to do if I was a full-time clinician. Um, there's some very minor aspects to the academic foundation program which go beyond the projects. One of those is that they're usually based in very good teaching hospitals that have a lot of opportunities. And if you take the AFP, you're usually in a fixed location and you're less likely to be moving around the country compared to some other F1, F2 jobs. So that's a very nice benefit. And also when you do move on to your next step, which could be an academic clinical fellowship, or it could be a PhD, or it could be a completely different career, the AFP gives you quite a bit of time to think about that application process and to think about what you're going to do next and make those applications. I think if you're a fully clinical F1, F2, you're just aiming to get to the end of it. You don't have time to think about what the next step might be. But if you're an AFP, you do have a little bit of time uh, to apply. And we talked today about the AFP application, which is three white space questions, about 250 words. The ACF application is about 10 to 15 white space questions, which are up to 600 words long each. So applying for an ACF, it takes a very long time to prepare. And if you have that AFP, you do get some time to do that as well. Um, so there's a lot of time and scope, and I think some of the benefits of the AFP actually just are the fact that you are a doctor who can explore all the opportunities in the world which are available to you. There's probably some arguments that you should be able to do that in a normal foundation program anyway. Um, that probably goes beyond the scope of this talk. Some of the negatives to do that I faced with the AFP was that mine was mostly academic time, but still had some on-call duties, uh, which was a fantastic experience. But balancing that academic and clinical time is very difficult. And often I would be the surgical SHO on night shifts, and I would finish my night shift at 8 a.m. And then I would go into the lab to trial some participants and do some academic work on basically zero hours sleep uh, and there is that expectation i think in some departments uh, in the academic world because there's a lot of responsibility on you to meet those deadlines not just for your sake but for your department's sake and to really build the reputation of the institute you join so it may be that you are doing a bit of a balancing act between your clinical and academic time and as i alluded to before my academic time didn't end with my academic time and you'll find that in the clinical world once you reach 5 p.m 6 p.m and the day is over the day is over but in the academic world there's no real start time or end time you may be expected to work late and as i moved on to an a e job i was still expected to go to the lab and continue my work which i was very happy to do but it did mean that at times you have to give up some of your um life commitments or maybe some of your holidays or something else and that this is all down to you of, of course but um if you want to gain the most out of it sometimes there is that pressure and in retrospect it may have been more beneficial for me to have said no actually i need that holiday i think one of the difficulties in the uk clinical system is that these academic opportunities and opportunities to do things 
and engaging very rare so it almost for you feel a little bit guilty to get this afp job and then take a two-week holiday in the middle of it so it's something to maybe bear in mind as you go into it um it's very difficult this being a very four month short experience to actually carve out what is yours which i found a difficulty with the afp it's easier if you start a project from scratch but if you don't you may end up joining a department doing a very small part and then when it comes to publishing that two or three years later it might be difficult for you to justify what you actually did so it's probably more important to focus on the skills that you're learning rather than the publications or presentations you may get and then i just wanted to comment on something we mentioned before about developing clinical skills as an academic i think it's important to demonstrate that you have the capacity to keep up with your colleagues with your clinical skills compared to theirs if you have less training time but i have to be honest and say that i don't know any academic doctor who i have felt is less clinically capable than their colleagues and i feel like this doesn't happen very often or at all so missing that four months of FY2, I don't think is significantly detrimental to your clinical ability, but it's important to demonstrate that you are ticking the boxes, that your portfolio is up to date, and that you are gaining your clinical skills uh, in line with your colleagues or better. Uh, but one aspect, I suppose, is that you're trying to update your research portfolio and your clinical portfolio, which can be quite difficult. So I think my biggest message is that the cons go about balancing this academic and clinical career together. But if you are applying for the AFP, you probably are doing it out of your interest and passion. So it's usually not an issue. And I think any other questions we're going to answer after the session, that's probably all I have to say. Thank you very much. Back to you, Daniel. Thanks. Um, yeah, as, as mentioned, we'll come back to the questions in the chat very shortly. Just to round off the talk, Tanya, do you want to tell people a little bit more about the upcoming AFP support we've got on offer? So um, we've been, you know, constantly mentioning this um, course that, um, you know, we will be launching very soon. So basically it is a high quality, completely free um, at the point of access and um, open access for all the students, not just final year, but everyone who's hoping to apply to the AFP in the next you know, months or few years. And this will take you guys through um, different key aspects, how to prepare for your application and through the interview stage to the end, which is selecting your jobs as well. And this will be in the form of uh, email jewels. So you will be getting a notification from us either via email or on uh, social media. So that will be the support that we've got. And in the future, we're hoping to also do mock interviews with you guys. Um, at the stage, you guys will have your interview, um, you know, invitation already. And perhaps in the future, when 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 we can, might be able to do some in-person uh, courses as well. So that's what we're planning to do in the next few months. We, we've already as well got a few blogs on our website with a bit more yeah. about the application process and a few Q&As with recent applicants as well that you can check out pretty much today if you wish, and there'll be more in the next few weeks as well. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, it looks like Holly has said that we don't have any time left for Q and A's. So um, I reckon what we need to do is probably to address these on Twitter, because um, I'm aware that there's another session coming after us. Sure. Yeah, so we'll, don't worry, we'll be, we'll be um, copy and you know paste these on Twitter and reply. So if you just um, follow us. We can also just post the answers in the chat here as well That's right good. now, just yeah. whilst you're waiting for the next one to get set up. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone. Sorry for being unable to answer the end um, for all the Q&A you have. Thank you, all the panelists, for your time today.